Crypto Trader is proudly brought to you by Element, a full-service investment bank for the digital token capital markets. Okay. Welcome to this week's edition of Crypto Trader and to our continuing coverage of Blockchain Week NYC. Today marks the beginning of the biggest and most important event in the crypto calendar, Consensus 2018. We're expecting 8,000 guests, a whole lot of breaking news, the biggest headlines and the biggest guests crypto can offer. Stay tuned because this is a show you don't want to miss. Consensus, the biggest and most important event in the crypto calendar? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you see coins moving on this. Look at there's 8,500 people here. How can this not be the most important thing? It's insane. Pump, what do you think of Consensus 2018? It's wild. Is this the biggest conference in the world? Uh, when it comes to crypto and blockchain, absolutely. There's nothing anywhere near as large as Consensus. Is it the biggest and most important event on the crypto calendar? It seems so. It's crazy. Uh, it's a lot of excitement and uh, enthusiasm, which I think is good for the uh, overall ecosystem. All the big names in crypto are here, and I've managed to catch up with Charlie Lee just off the stage. Charlie, welcome back to Crypto Trader. Thanks for having me, Ryan. Charlie, I want to get something out the way before we talk about interoperability and chains. You sold all your Litecoin tokens last year. You sold them at the highest price or near the highs. And there was a lot of controversy as to why you sold them. Maybe you could just clarify that for us. Sure. Well, first thing is, when I, when I was selling them, I didn't realize this was going to be the high. <laughs> just, just luck. <laughs> yeah. Well, in hindsight, I mean, it was, we were saying, like, I obviously knew it was going to crash. But like, how would I know? <laughs> I wish I'd followed you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so the question is like, why did I sell it? So uh, for a conflict of interest, so I wanted to kind of focus on the project and I was becoming a pretty big, like, um, I had a huge Twitter following. So whenever I, I tweeted anything, it could affect the price up or down. And I didn't want to kind of have my hands tied, not be able to tweet something good because it could effectively be like, kind of helping my own like being seen as me helping myself financially as opposed to for the best of the project and I also saw sometimes like I would know that some things are actually good for the price in the short term but actually bad for the project long term so I wanted to make sure that my incentives are aligned with the project long term as opposed to my financial gain short term and I've made kind of enough to be well off and not to have to work for anyone. So I can work for myself on Litecoin full time and that was enough for me. So I decided to kind of just sell all my coins. I actually kept a little bit so that I can still like test it and transact with it um, to buy little things. But. but what about the critics that say that you now have no skin in the game? How do you respond to those guys? Yeah, well, I, I actually think I have more skin in the game than everyone else. Um, because I, this is like my baby, right? My project. I wanted to succeed more than um, anyone else in the world. And it's not all about financial reasons, right? So It's your personal integrity. Yeah, it's my integrity. It's my legacy, kind of, right? So if Litecoin succeeds, I can be proud of it. And that's worth much more to me than, than money in this world. Why is interoperability so important? Yeah, so like right now we have so many different coins like Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum. They're all they're separate silos. So um, being able to like transfer value across chains is, is something that's really cool. So you can have all these chains will be interoperable and connected. For example, using Lightning Network's uh, atomic swaps, I can send Litecoin and then you receive Bitcoin on their end or vice versa. Now, technologically, how does it work? Lightning Network right now is sitting on top of both Bitcoin and Litecoin. It's a second layer solution. 
And if someone's running Lightning Network on both Bitcoin and Litecoin, then they can transfer value between the two networks. Let's go back to Litecoin. The last time we spoke, you guys were doing well. There was a lot of adoption. It was growing every day. How are we doing today? Uh, good. Uh, we have more and more uh, payment processors um, supporting Litecoin, letting, uh, making it easy for merchants to, to accept Litecoin. So this is a chicken and egg problem. I keep saying that because like you need merchants want users to spend before they'll make it worthwhile for them to accept it and users need places to spend it before they'll actually use it. So what do you think of Consensus 2018? It's huge, amazing. I came all the way from Dubai to witness it. Bigger than your expectation? A lot of people. How many people do you think are here? Probably 5,000. I was told it's going to be like 5,000 people. Now they say that it's eight. How many people are here? So we had 8,400 people register. About 7,700 had checked in. We expected 4,000 when we started playing the event a year ago and 8,400, 8,500 was just, it's insane. Back to our coverage of Consensus 2018 and I've managed to track down Israel's biggest crypto investor, Moshe Chogeg. Moshe, you've got a very interesting story about how you came into crypto. Maybe give us your background. Yeah, you know, so I, I actually started as an entrepreneur, uh, uh, built few companies, went from zero to a billion, back to almost a zero, then uh, uh, started a VC, a successful one in Israel, the most active VC in Israel. And then at the end of uh, 16, I was introduced to Ethereum. Even though I bought Bitcoin at early 13, Ethereum really got me excited by the whole concept of smart contracts. So I wanted to invest a few millions for my fund, only to discover that my legal team told me that as a VC, I'm not allowed to invest in something that is not equity. So I said, what do you mean? It's a, it's a great technology, I want to invest. I went to my LPs to get a consent and I didn't ended up investing my own money, thank God. So, you know, we invested at uh, slightly below eight bucks and uh, still ordering, very happy from Ethereum. Uh, then we started to boost the Israeli ecosystem because we saw only seven companies was doing blockchain at the time, uh, ending up investing in tons of them and uh, boosting up the, the Israeli industry, but not only the, the Israeli industry. There are tons of ICOs pitching us every single day. They're all starting to sound the same. What are you looking for? So, you know, either we will see that the core dev team is really different. Like, for example, I really like the team at Cardano, EOS, or they're really different from the other ones. Uh, uh, so basically when we see something like this, we'll put a lot of capital in. Or we see unique ideas like proof of location, uh, uh, exchanges are interesting. So you spoke about blockchain, you spoke about EOS, you spoke about Cardano. We know those two, but you also spoke about a company called Orbs. Yeah. What is Orbs? So Orbs is trying to do similar things to Cardano and EOS. The biggest difference that I see from the Orbs team is that they understand that when big companies want to tap in into the blockchain space, they, they need to have the ability to update. Okay, you can't wait for uh, Vitalik to decide or for the consensus of the Bitcoin community to, to vote. You need to have a, a kind of centralized ledger uh, uh, that has the ability to be uh, to, to enjoy the benefit of decentralization but also have the ability of the CEO up until a certain time to still uh, be able to, 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 to upgrade. So, so OBS taking this approach. So making experience. crypto more usable to the man on the street, not to the people that are walking around here, but to the man on the street. Uh, you know, in the end, if my mom is not able to use it, then, then it's, it's gonna be dead eventually. That's Moshe Chogeg. He's the biggest crypto investor in Israel. He's told you what he's investing in. Stay tuned for more coverage from Consensus 2018. I bet like many people from all around the world just gather. It's like blockchain family gathering. It shows you what the greatness of blockchain pretty much. But I see many events taking place all over the world, from Africa, Middle East, uh, China. Wherever you go, there is a blockchain event. Are you finding that too many people here? Um, I don't know. I kind of like it when there's a lot of people because you can hang out with the group that you most align with. So No complaints. Maybe it's an idea of decentralization that's attracting people from all over the world. It's attracting people from all over the world. It's attracting media from all over the world. Yesterday I saw CNN 
Bloomberg, CNBC, Cheddar, all reporting live from Consensus 2018. Crypto is no longer taboo. We're going mainstream. We've known each other for a long time. I actually remember back in the 1970s, you said information about the package is important, as important as the package itself. How do we achieve quality in the network? Just off the stage, Don Tapscott, who did an amazing talk. Don, for our viewers who are not familiar with who you are. Well, I started in the 1970s writing about the digital age, and I wrote a book about the internet in 1981. And the digital economy was the first bestseller about the web. And since then, I've had 16 books. I chair and run the Blockchain Research Institute. So, Blockchain Revolution, you guys are releasing a second edition to the first edition that you released earlier. Now, Don, yesterday when you spoke on stage, you spoke about seven classes of crypto assets. Right. Let's talk about that in more depth. What are the seven classes? How do we categorize this? Well, it turns out this has kind of been mud on the windshield because if a lot of stuff is happening and you can't categorize it or understand what it is, it's a problem for regulators, it's a problem for investors, and it's a problem for entrepreneurs because you don't really know what tool to use, what kind of token to fulfill what purpose. So it turns out there aren't just security tokens and, and utility tokens, there's seven types. Um, there are currencies like Bitcoin and the other currencies and think of Think of Bitcoin as sort of the first killer app of the Internet of, Info of Value. Like email was the first big app of the Internet of Information. Then we have platforms. These are these fat protocol, general purpose platforms that look more like the web. And that you, where you can build any application, like Aeon, Icon, um, um, even Ethereum. Uh, yeah, Polka, uh, Polkadot Ethereum, of course, uh, was the first one up. Uh, but we've got really exciting ones coming out, like Cosmos, based on Tendermint, the Internet of Blockchains. The third type is um, what we what we would call utility tokens, and they provide some kind of function. They enable a Golem to have a di distributed resource network. The fourth type we call natural asset tokens. They're physical assets in the world that can be tokenized, but also synthetic ones, like a carbon credit. So carbonx.ca is tokenizing carbon credits, and you'll buy the green lawnmower at Home Depot because it comes with tokens. And that's a security token. I mean, that's, that's well, like no, an asset not. being tokenized. Well, no, but it's not a security in the sense of a, of a, a security of, as in the Securities Act of 1934. And the thing about a security is it performs a certain function in the financial industry. And often the way that the regulators judge your security is did you buy this in the hope that it's going to go way up in value. But when you buy a Carbonex token, you're not hoping it goes up way up in value. You're getting it because you can offset carbon and turn your product into a carbon neutral uh, uh, product. Then we have crypto uh, collectibles. We collect all kinds of things, but you can never collect digital things because of the, the double spend problem. Satoshi solved that. So if you created a digital kitty, anyone could copy it. Well, now you can't. So the big class of that is the ERC721 token, which is the crypto kitty token. Yeah, exactly. And then um, the final one is uh, uh, fiat-based cryptocurrencies or stable coins. So that, that's what's going to happen. We're all going to be using the US dollar, only it'll be a cryptocurrency. And you've got companies like Sweetbridge that create a token that's pegged to an asset, not just gold or, or something. That, that theirs is actually based on your supply chain as, as a security, and the token is pegged to the US dollar. So you issue this token, you can borrow money from yourself. So these are all really different, and we hope that the new book will help bring some clarity to the market. So Don, when you look at the market today, and you, we compare it to where we were last year, last year was the year of the ICO. Everybody did an ICO off the back of Ethereum. We developed a whole lot of platforms. We developed blockchains. We developed Icon and Aeon and WanChain and Ethereum. What's the trend going forward? What should we be looking out for going forward? Well, as I said in my opening speech to the Congress here, I think the next stage has to do with the enterprise. It's not, it doesn't mean tokens won't be important. They'll be part of uh, many enterprise applications. But we're in the early days of a profound change to the deep structure and architecture of the corporation. How we orchestrate capability in society to innovate, to create goods and services. 
And the reason is that blockchain is radically dropping the transaction costs that cause us to bring things inside the boundaries of a firm. The cost of search. Well, you can, you know, it's really expensive to raise money. Well, now you can do it through an ICO. The cost of contracting. If every little activity in the economy required a contract, that would be prohibitive. But now we have smart contracts to automate that. The cost of coordination. Imagine trying to make a, a camera or something with a whole bunch of people who never met. No, we bring it inside the boundaries of a firm. But now blockchain drops the cost of doing that. And overall, the cost of establishing trust. So companies are going to look more like networks, and our, a decentralized future is guaranteed. You can always trust an Israeli hacker to find a hack in the system. Barak, tell me about this hack. So actually, uh, Ron, it's, it's not really a hack. It's actually going by the book. Um, we've been involved in crypto since 2013. And we're bugged by the fact that uh, crypto, actually, they're called cryptocurrencies by just a name. Legally, they're not currencies and they're not money. And that's uh, a big, big barrier for mainstream adoption. So regulars don't want to recognize cryptos as money. And, and, and each regular has their own answer. The SEC would say it's a security. The CFTC would say it's a commodity. The IRS says it's property. Uh, so we need to pay capital gain tax when you buy a cup of coffee. Wait, st stop right there. Are you saying when I buy a cup of coffee using Bitcoin, I need to pay capital gain tax? Yeah, it's ridiculous, but that's the way it is uh, most countries around the world. Um, if, because in 2014, the IRS said that Bitcoin and virtual currencies act like money, but they're not money because they're not the legal tender of a sovereign nation and therefore they are treated like property. So that actually makes cryptos dead in the water from day-to-day -day usage. That's why we don't really see people using it to buy stuff. We're in a cryptocurrency convention. I don't think even a single person here bought anything with a cryptocurrency today. And we want to bring cryptocurrencies to mainstream adoption. So we want banks to use them, we want my mom to use it. So how do we do this? So the first step is we have a crypto which is really legally money. So we ask yourself, what is the legal definition of money? So the regulars say money is something which is the legal tender of a sovereign nation. So we, we went on a quest, we worked on this project in stealth mode for a year and a half now, and we literally had a spreadsheet of all the sovereign nations in the world, and we asked ourselves which one doesn't have a currency now. Um, and we, that's how we got to the Marshall Islands. It's a tiny, uh, beautiful nation in the middle of the Pacific. They don't have their own currency now, they use US dollars. And we said it doesn't matter how big the country is, it just needs to be a sovereign nation, member of the UN. And so we, we got there. And so you we, went to the Marshall Islands. We went to the Marshall Islands. You convinced the Marshall Islands to adopt your currency, or a new currency, as their sovereign currency. And now, as a matter of law, as a matter of a bill of law, a cryptocurrency is legal tender in the Marshall Islands? We signed an agreement with the government and, we, and they passed the legislation in their parliament, they're a democracy, they, uh, they passed the legislation declaring the currency, SOV, sovereign, as legal tender of the Marshall Islands. So today is sovereign legal tender in Marshall Islands? So today we have the law, now what we're doing, we're uh, finalizing our blockchain technology, we're developing it. And we also finalized the legal structure to start fundraising in the world's first IMO, the world's first initial monetary offering, where a sovereign country is issuing its currency to the public, not via central bank, because it's completely decentralized, it's a, it is mining and everything, but via an IMO, uh, and it's going to be fascinating. So what does this mean worldwide? Does this mean that a bank, a normal bank in the USA, can trade this and hold this. That's absolutely true, Ron. So now, basically, by virtue of the SOV being legal tender in a sovereign nation, it's legally money. So a bank can trade it. A bank can actually open a checking account denominated in SOV. We can even connect SOV to SWIFT because it's both a crypto and a fiat currency. And it really opens up the, the ball game for a lot of use cases that, were not, that are not possible with any other cryptocurrency. Where can we find more information? Um, our website is uh, www.sov.global and the Telegram is uh, official SOV. Last year, Forbes published a list called the Crypto Rich List. It was a list of the richest people in crypto. Number six on the list was Matthew Rozak from Block. 
and I managed to track him down at Consensus 2018. Number six, was it, was it right? Uh, I think it's a silly list. What's interesting in this space is uh, now this, this industry and a lot of entrepreneurs have resources. And I think those resources are really important to affect change uh, from advocacy to philanthropy to art. Uh, so I think having resources as an industry where we're still in the early days uh, is a good thing. I'm sure our viewers want to know if the list was accurate. I mean, were the numbers in the list accurate? But I think uh, more so, uh, look at the impact people are making. You know, what are they building? Who are they hiring? Where are they investing? I think that is, uh, I think, a better indicator of what uh, people are up to. We've seen your name on all the lanyards. We've seen your name everywhere. What is Block? What are you guys building? Uh, at the end of the day, that's what we are. We're builders. We're plumbers in this space. And Block is divided into two, two worlds, much like the uh, the world of crypto today where you have the enterprise world, uh, the blockchain of things, and uh, the crypto world, the tokenization of things. And so on Block Enterprise, uh, we build uh, uh, a whole stack of software to interact with a token economy. So think of wallets, nodes, uh, dev environments, data layers, uh, and we have some of the biggest companies in the world uh, using that, uh, both on the enterprise side and then on the crypto side. So our, cu our customers are you know, kind of the Fortune 50 and the Crypto 50, if you will. And what so other projects are you working on today that you're excited for for the rest of 2018? Uh, well, uh, for Block, it's Metronome. Uh, you know, it's a, uh, really we finally excited. have a launch date. It's yeah. the 18th of yeah. June. So, so it takes time uh, for uh, uh, for an autonomous network. So Metronome, we're really excited about. We've got a date of uh, a launch for uh, for June 18th. Uh, other ones that uh, I like a lot are uh, Orchid, Orchid Protocol. Uh, so Steve Waterhouse has got a fantastic vision uh, for Orchid, and they're going through their, uh, their process now uh, to build and launch that. One more project that you're excited about for 2018. Well, the next uh, project that Block is working on is, uh, is a new fundamental blockchain that we're uh, uh, composing right now, it's called Vesper, and uh, you'll hear more about it in the Q3 timeframe, and uh, by, the, by that time I'll, I'll come back and give you an update. But it's really going to be Q3, you're not going to keep us in suspense like you did with Metronome. You know, uh, <laughs> the suspense sometimes helps, uh, but you know, good things uh, take, take longer sometimes than anticipated, but I'll give you a hearty update in Q3. Great. Matt, it's so good awesome. to see you, always good to have you on our show. Thanks, Ryan. Let's hear from some more big names here at Consensus. Walking through the halls of Consensus, the biggest crypto show in the crypto calendar, I walk into our sponsors, eToro. Everywhere you go, you see eToro. On the back of the chairs, it's eToro. Even on the serviettes, I saw eToro. Yoni, is eToro going full crypto? We're going full crypto, uh, and we're making a couple of very big announcements actually today at Consensus around going full crypto. So, because we, you sponsor us, and this is CNBC, I think you should make the announcements on the show. What do you say? Done, I'm gonna do them right now. All right, so what are the announcements? So we're gonna announce uh, that we're launching a wallet. Um, I'm gonna do a quick demo of the wallet for you uh, in a couple of minutes. Let me have a look. Okay. So it's a mobile wallet? So it's a mobile wallet where you can basically both look at all of your crypto assets on eToro. So you can see here my Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, EOS and NEO and you can actually send and receive directly basically Bitcoin and then add basically uh, other cryptocurrency wallets as well. Now can I, can I trade off this wallet? So right now you can't trade so what we've done is we separated the trading platform where you're able to trade real time fast uh, to basically the crypto wallet where you actually have your own address Every transaction here is a Bitcoin uh, blockchain transaction. Now, do you hold your private keys for this wallet? So in this wallet, we actually hold the private keys on a multi-sig, two out of three. So uh, basically, we custody the private keys. So if you lose your phone or if somebody tries to rob you, he can't. What's the next announcement? Uh, we're also announcing that uh, we'll be launching later this year an exchange, uh, which uh, is getting into uh, alpha mode. Um, and uh, another very big announcement for us, which is very exciting here in the consensus in New York, is that uh, we're uh, planning to launch in the US. Uh, so that's a very big uh, milestone for eToro. So eToro is taking over the crypto world and also taking over the real world. Yes, exactly. Yoni, I know you love crypto. What's sitting in your crypto portfolio today? Well, first of all, I'm a very big believer in crypto, so over 50% of my investments are in crypto. The main part of my portfolio is still very boring, 
it's Bitcoin and Ethereum. I think my kids and my grandkids are going to know what Bitcoin is. Other than that, I'm doing a lot of my investments in ICOs through iAngels, which uh, uh, you've interviewed as well, good friend of ours, and disclaimer, my wife. Um, and uh, so we've been investing in a lot of the both Israeli ICOs, uh, so Kalu, Blocks, uh, formerly Coindash, um, uh, Dow Stack, which recently closed their ICO. Now we Fermo. saw a project earlier, we saw Fermo earlier. Did you guys invest in Fermo? We did, we did. I think it's a very interesting project, great entrepreneur. Um, and it's very interesting to figure out how to build those derivatives on top of Ethereum. Uh, we actually are working with Fermo on a couple of interesting use cases, like how can you really use Fermo and create something that people here would want to use. That's Yanni from Itoro, and they make this show possible. They're our sponsors. A big shout out to them. Thank you very much. That brings to a close our first part of our coverage from New York Blockchain Week and from Consensus. I'm off to an appearance at Fast Money. Until next week, trade well, my friends. Let's bring in Rand Neuner. He is the founder of OnChain Capital, the host of CNBC Africa's Crypto Trader. Rand, great to have you back. Nice to be here. So obviously this was a major um, topic at Consensus. This is a major topic in the crypto world in general, and that is how does the SEC, how does the CFTC sort of divvy up the world? And Well, I think the initiative by, by the SEC was a great one, but I think the joke is on the SEC now because they need to come out with regulation. If they don't come out with regulation, then they may stifle an entire industry. Now, I know they're balancing investor protection with the need to grow an industry, but if you look to places like Japan and Singapore, They've got thriving ICOs and they've got a thriving new industry. And my fear, having traveled extensively to that region and spoken to all the founders and the legislators there, is that the USA actually may be falling behind. So I think the SEC did adopt a responsible approach by taking their time to see what's happening with the industry. But now we know that crypto is real. We know that this thing, the blockchain and crypto isn't going away anytime soon. And now they've got to come to the party and give us some kind of regulation so we know where we stand. There are thousands, right, of coins out there. Which is the one that you are most excited about right now? So I'm excited for a new generation of protocols like Ethereum. And in that, there's a whole lot of, of protocols. Uh, Oasis, Zilliqa, um, Thunder Token. These are all new blockchains which are coming up. And they're promising 10,000 transactions per second. These are all tokens which are promising scalability, security, and decentralization. Yeah. But they don't have the developer community that Ethereum has got. Okay. And that's why I said I'm going to hurdle Ethereum, but I am placing some other bets on these new, these new um, side chains. Rand, great to see you. Thanks for coming by. Rand Neuner, CBC Africa.